Matt. Hey, buddy. How are you? Hey. Uh, I got a question for you. I have an answer for you, I, th- I hope. Do we know a guy who knows, like, absurd amounts about stats and, like, made it his whole YouTube identity in a cool way? I know a guy. Do you know a guy? I do know a guy. Would you would you con- consider him, like, intelligent, or is he, like, one with the fools? I think, you know, 2001 to 2004 is statistically the best run any professional baseball player has ever had, period. And we probably won't see anything like it again. 17 last at bat wins for the Giants. The pitch to Bond. Swing! So uh, I want to give you a little bit of a life update, all right? So I'm in a really good mood. Let me just say that, all right? Knicks, got to represent. They won nine straight today. Got some Froyo. Wow. I got some Froyo I'm going to pick at. It's orange, like Giants. Uh, I have no idea what that is. Froyo, it's called frozen yogurt. Uh, oh, is that? You, okay. You probably know what that is. I do. Make yogurt yeah. if it was frozen, mm-hmm. uh, like ice cream. Wow. Uh, However, while, while being in such good spirits, I, I kind of realized that we screwed up pretty royally in the first episode. Do tell. Where did we mess up? So we forgot to mention that in the so-called movie uh, Rookie of the Year from the early 90s, Oof. Uh, it features a 12-year-old who can throw 100 miles an hour. Mm. Uh, in, in a montage with real major leaguers, he struck out Pirates Barry Bonds, who appears as himself. You're uh, right. I forgot about that. And why it's important to mention now is because now that we're getting into 2001 to 2004, uh, striking out Barry Bonds is not a thing you really do anymore, let alone if you're 12. Uh, so we improved a lot, which is considering we were talking about a guy we were saying was the best player in baseball. Oh, my God. Wait till we get to 2004. His strikeout to walk ratio, it's one of the more unbelievable stats I've ever seen in my entire life. It's actually pretty incredible. I've never seen anybody master hitting the way. It seems like Barry Bonds did it this time. Yeah. So some of the numbers we'll talk about, I guess, really hit that home. I believe 2001 is his age 37 season, which when you're 37 and this... 36? Okay, so 36. I'm overshooting him a little bit, but 36... Um, you don't really, a lot of guys don't even stay in the league today at 36. And do you want, you want to know what he did? And when he was 36, he had 73 home runs in a season. Yes, he hit 73 home runs. That's not even, I think the most impressive stat in his four years that we're going to talk about today. No, but it's the one you got to start with for 2001 and 2004. Like remember that home run record thing that we talked about that McGuire and Sosa were doing McGuire gets to 70. And in 2001, just three years after that, uh, Bonds blows the door wide open, goes to 73. Um, at that age, too, 36, which is just mind-boggling that anybody can do that in general. That is 11 home runs more than Aaron Judge hit this year, uh, which everyone is totally wrapped up in Aaron Judge fever. You can't, I can't even imagine what it must have been like for Barry Bonds uh, at that time. Uh, just crushing the record, 73 home runs. It's just, you, even when you do like the auto sims on MLB The Show, like no one even comes remotely close to that. Like remotely close to that. No no one at all. Mm-hmm. And I think we were talking about in the previous episode, maybe you can remind me if I'm, mis- if I'm remembering this incorrectly, that uh, when McGuire and Sosa were having that race, Bonds kind of wanted in on it, it seemed like. I don't know mm-hmm. if it was jealousy or whatever it might have been, but... You know, a guy like Barry Bonds, as competitive as he is, always wanting to be the best and thinking he is that. Um, he wanted in, and he did more than get in. He he blew away the competition and did it pretty soon into the season. His first 50 games, he hit 28 homers, huh. which, think about having 28 homers in May. That's like a good season, a good <laughs> season total. <laughs> Not even two months into the season. What a good way to work Absolutely that. insane. Like, that's video game potential right there absolutely incredible can i argue it's better than that considering i'm just going to lean heavily on something i just said like if you do this if you max out a guy who's like 99 everything a creative player in the show 
and you just totally sim a season, they're not hitting 73 home runs. No, you'll never, even like statistically, if you sim that on MLB The Show, you're never really going to see that ever. At least I used to sim a lot of seasons on MLB The Show when I was a kid for fun. Never once. And I'm sure you did too. I'm sure a lot of people listening have too that have played the game. You'll never see that. Now the point is, I guess I'll dumb it down to a trivia question. Uh, how many players in a season have hit more home runs than Barry Bonds? For the people listening and not watching, I'm holding up a zero. The For most the people listening and not watching, I'm even throw you. But also, I would very much like to talk about, this is going to be a common theme for these four years especially, and this was the case for his entire career, but Bonds' ability to get on base. I mean, the walk numbers are just absurd. Would you mind if I speak to that point for just one quick second? I Not only would I not mind it, I would love almost nothing more in my whole life. So we'll talk more about this in depth later, and there's a bigger point here, but Bonds also broke the single season walk record uh, for a player, beating out Babe Ruth, who walked 170 times in 1923, who was widely considered and is still considered to be uh, maybe the most dangerous hitter in baseball history. I'm not saying I necessarily have that opinion, but Bonds beat Ruth out in quite a lot of different stats, including his walk total in in 20, I'm sorry, in 2001. Nobody wanted to pitch to him. And this was the case throughout these three years at this point of his career. I think it's underselling it to say no one wanted to pitch to him. I'd go one step further and say they were afraid to pitch to him. Uh, I believe he's the only player in a season to have 200 walks, which 200 any like 200 hits is considered really good. 200 walks is just like it's a club of one there, and it inspired one of the gems of 2010's YouTube, which is the John Boyce Barry Bonds hitting without a bat theory, <laughs> which is it takes the idea that Barry Bonds could hit without a bat. The, the, the pitcher doesn't know he has a bat though in this crazy hypothetical. And his on-base percentage in the sim was actually higher. Of just the the message it represented in the in the sim that John Boyce did was that, which John Boyce is an unbelievably elite YouTube creator, not just a sports Absolutely. YouTube creator, just YouTube in general, is that just the mere threat of him in the box was enough to get him on base. Like it tried to prove, like you could never prove this in like real life. It'd be crazy if you did, but just this idea that you could you know, have just the mere threat of him in the box, not have a bat and still get on base 60% of the time. 60% so, of the time. More, not, I didn't say 50, I said 60. So I'm gonna make this point earlier. On Baseball Almanac, it's listing the single season leaders for walk totals. Um, so Babe Ruth originally had the record in 1923 for 170. Barry Bonds in 2001 breaks that record by seven walks. The number one on this list is Barry Bonds at 232. So the difference between Barry Bonds and his total in 2004 and the second best human being to play the sport is the same as the difference between Babe Ruth. And I literally have to scroll through this entire website and you still can't find the person. The site ends. <laughs> <laughs> we're, at, we're at list, we're at 500. We're like 500 players down and the site ends. There's nobody. <laughs> to fill that second spot. Oh my god. Yeah, 232. So, which of Bonds' two um, counting stat single season um, leads as far as the um, number of walks he accumulated in, I think it was 04, or the number of homers he hit in 01? What do you think is more unbreakable, harder to break? I would, I would have to say it's probably the walks. A big part of that is he had 120 intentional walks that season, and you just don't see teams intentionally walk anyone to anywhere near that degree even if barry bonds prime barry bonds were to appear in major league baseball today he would not get intentionally walked that often uh it's also worth pointing out with regards to just that four-year span in general and the walks bonds had 284 intentional walks in that four-year span but he also had 136 plate appearances where he never saw a pitch in the strike zone and walked on four pitches and i would call these unintentional intentional walks because they never intended to pitch to him either way and in, in a single season 232 is 2004 we're mm. sort of out of order but who cares yeah. this is just so we're talking about the 01 to 04 era and it's just like we're geeks we're baseball geeks we're gonna go out of order just out of sheer like inability to contain ourselves it's, it's just kind of what 
it's par for the course here when you talk about like there's nothing like like the, the just Barry Bonds's baseball reference page just looking at the statistics it, there's no site like it there's no more italics and bold like and I, I think I could type a paper 12 like 12 space like 12 font whatever what you know that cliche that everyone wrote essays and whatever it was the size all that if i made that whole thing bold and italicized it would probably stand out less than than just looking at the baseball reference page because baseball reference does either bold or bold and italics if you lead like the league in a stat and you know when you hit 73 home runs and walk 230 times you're gonna lead the league so there's gonna be a lot of bold and italics there and it just takes up the whole the whole screen practically his savant page would have been crazy <laughs> That Stop, thing you don't even nuts. get me started. And in 2001, to kind of tie it back, get ourselves back on track, his OBP was 515, which was not even close to where he, he was going to be at two no, different not points even close. In, in this four-year span. Just absolutely absurd. His OPS plus was 259, still not peaking. Still. And he hit 73 home runs. And... <laughs> he had six, 664 plate appearances, and his at-bats is, is so much lower because of the amount of times that he walked. I've never seen just such a stark difference between someone's plate appearances and, and at-bat totals. Just absolutely crazy. But actually, before we move any forward, it's kind of crazy how we've already been talking about 2001 bonds for, I don't know, like 10 minutes at this point. I told you this would be enough. Well, the, the point, though, is that he hit 73 home runs, which is kind of like one of the crazier things that have ever happened in the sport. And we still haven't really even talked about that. We've been talking about everything else, his walks, his on-base percentage, his ability to hit the ball in general. And we're, we still haven't touched on, you know, the most one of the most incredible feats of strength in the history of the sport. And I don't think the Giants made the playoffs that year, tying back into a point we talked about last time. One team or one player is not going to carry a team the playoffs in baseball that's just the way it works they did not make the playoffs having a, the record for single season home runs by one player and uh you know we haven't said this in a little while he won the mvp in 2001 if it went to anybody else like you might as well have like melted down the trophy and have it have no value anymore because you are not out doing getting on base more than 51 percent of the time which you just don't do and 73 home runs which you don't even dream about and it's not even his best season, in my opinion, of these four. If you look at the single season OPS Plus leaderboard, Barry Bonds put together the best, second best, and 10th best single season OPS Plus in the history of the National and American Leagues in 2001, 2002, 2003, 2004. Yeah, we touched on that earlier. Just The 73 home runs, the OPS Plus record, and the OBP record are three different seasons. So mm -hmm. how would you say, like, Variance is a big thing in the statistics, and there was like next to none of that in these three years. What would you say is the thing that stood out the most of like consistency in that time? So for me, whenever I think about this period, I'm reminded of like the old piece of baseball wisdom, which had always been that the best hitters are only successful 30% of the time. And maybe that's true if the numerator is hits and the denominator is at bats. But like in a world where on base percentage is king, Barry Bond successfully got on base 56% of the time between 2001 and 2004. So he was making outs less often than he was getting on base by a significant margin, which you just don't do at any level, except like if you're 17 years old playing in the Little League World Series, maybe, and that's it. Right, yes. He, he completely destroys our preconceived notions of what a good hitter is. It's not someone who succeeds 30% of the time. It's someone who succeeds, in his case, more than half the time. Uh, he also has 500th home run. I know we like to keep track of his milestones, or we have been through the past few episodes, so it's just worth saying that he's at 500 home runs at this point, and he's going to finish with over... Actually, let me rephrase that point. So he's 36 at this point. He hits his 500th career home run in this 30, age 36 season, and he finishes his career with over 700 home runs. A lot more than 700. A lot more than 700. Just think about that. At, at age 36, to finish at, what is it, 760-something? I think it's 762. 762. 762. At age 36, he was sitting at 500. It's pretty, you know what, pretty crazy. 
you know what the stat I do remember is just because how my brain works 2002 to kind of switch gears a little bit mm-hmm. is he has the highest OPS plus in a season in MLB history 268 168% better than league average and plus his OBP was 582 it's not even his best OBP of this four year stretch his home run total is only like in the 40s too yeah, 46. It dipped a bit. He had five homers in his first four games. So I'm sure people were thinking he was going to top what he did in L1, but he kind of cooled off a bit. I don't know why that was. Why Such what a, was? I understand 73 is not sustainable, but still, it's a pretty significant drop-off. I know that he also had the most home runs in first-half history in 2001. I think it's 39. Uh, yeah. So right. it's... Uh, Maybe unsustainable is maybe not the word. It's just more of like he got to say he got hot is like really underselling it. Like whatever the hot is that like melts planets is probably <laughs> what he was up to just for a little bit. And I guess the mathematical term or statistical term is unsustainable, but I think it's a lot more simple than that. Like this man just kind of got the fear of God put in everybody. And when he did swing, it would just go into, you know, that body of water out there in right field in san francisco he hit for 370 too you know batting average everyone has their own takes on the stat but pretty consistent batting average is a good way of seeing consistency uh mm-hmm. so if you have a high batting average you pretty much didn't have very many slumps 370 he just didn't get cold he was just hot all the time really consistent really reliable no down period which if you get 73 home runs in a season the the thought of a down period is just like way out the window already and quickly uh about 2001 just to reverse course just a tiny bit there was an article from you know mike petriello from yes he was i guess doing a simulation or running the math on how many home runs 2001 bonds would have hit at course field can i guess and it? sure 87. Not a bad guess. No, 95. <laughs> <laughs> Had he been a Colorado Rocky, he would have hit 95 home runs. Oh my God. That, that yeah. high elevation. He's in the division, though. He's going to play in Coors Field. Mm-hmm. Good amount every year. But ball flies in Coors Field a lot more than it does in San Francisco. There's a both really far and really high wall out there in right field that a left handed hitter like Bonds has to deal with if he's going to pull the ball. Uh, and in Colorado, that ball is flying. Whatever is like the step above flying is probably what's happening to that ball. Uh, and it's just like, look at us, like totally geeked up thinking about this. And it earned him uh, a pretty bit nice contract with the Giants in 2002. I don't know if it was a contract extension or if he resigned. I think he resigned. Um, but yeah, five, year, five years, 90 mil at age 37. You know, the Giants were taking a flyer on this guy at 37. I mean, not to blame them. The guy hit 73 home runs as a 36-year-old. I think you could take a flyer on him. And so. here's the thing. In 2002, it it worked. Not only did he break the OPS Plus record, I can't believe I'm going to say this with all the buildup we talked about. Barry Bonds played in the World Series. He was fantastic in the playoffs. I think oh. he had like three, 322. He set the home run record and the walk record because, of course, he did in a single postseason at that time. The home run record has since been broken. Randy Rosarena has it now. Uh, But put yourself in 2002 headspace. If there's things Barry Bonds does, it's break home run records and break walk records. And uh, he did both of those in the 2002 postseason where he kind of put the Giants on his back. Finally, we've been talking about, you know, these near misses for Bonds for who knows how long this is the year they finally break out they they win the division series uh, in five then they win the nlcs in five to go to the world series they go play the angels uh in that 2002 world series game two he hits one of the longest balls probably ever hit i remember foolish baseball talking about it in his bonds and four video that the scoreboard like graphic on the tv changes before the ball even lands you can see Tim Salmon mouthing. That's the farthest ball that I've ever seen hit. But in the game and in the series, they still did lose. I think it was mental. Like, do you think that, you know, Bonds now being this behemoth, this titan, coming off the heels of 2001, he can kind of, you know, he has that confidence now. I know he was really, really good 
uh, even when he struggled in the playoffs. But, like this is a different Barry Bonds than, uh, than he was. It could be. I think that. I mean, I don't have the ability to like read his mind, especially read his mind twenty one years pretty much after this course, happened. Yeah. Uh, I I think maybe that there's a good possibility of that, just from like what I'm gonna educated guess this thing. Uh, what I do know is that that point we made earlier of you know no one player can do it himself. Barry Bonds probably came the closest, like in a single World Series, and they still lost. They had a three games to two lead going to Anaheim uh, for game six and seven. They lose them both. They were one one win away. Really did come close. They kind of tasted it for a little bit, uh, and they didn't come through. I checked before we were here. Bonds had an okay game seven. He went one for three with a walk. Uh, but that wasn't going to cut it. The Angels hoisted the trophy. Giants went home sad. One of the coolest things about the 02 World Series has nothing to do with Bonds, though, which is Kenny Lofton hits an extra base hit off the wall in San Francisco, and JT Snow is the lead runner. He comes in and scores, and manager Dusty Baker's bat boy is his son, who is about two years old. Uh, Matt made a face for those in the audio only that he knows okay. what I'm talking about where a grown man almost barrels over a child uh, who's trying to pick up a bat instead he picks him up there's this really cute embrace that was all over the point like all over the or the place uh, misspoke there for a sec but uh, why I bring this up is I was watching a spring training game a couple days ago and that kid is like a professional baseball player now. It is nuts to me how what? time flies. Who's he playing for? He's in the Nationals organization. Who The Nationals wow. were not a baseball team when that incident took place. And that was, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Dusty managed the, the Nationals, right? He did. He's, he's with Houston now. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. I remember there was a big thing when Houston played Washington in a spring training game. They share a facility in West mm -hmm. Palm Beach, Florida. You were never uh, there. We were there. We watched a fellow YouTuber by the name of Five Points Fids totally wipe out trying to get a home run ball. <laughs> uh, unbelievable times, but that's neither here nor there. I do remember just to close that thought, though, that the Nats manager, Davey Martinez, promised Dusty he'd get him in the game. But there was another surprise that he delivered the lineup card to his father uh, and with the umpires at home plate. So it's just so nuts how time flies is kind of the point I was going to make that that happened in. 2002 everybody remembers that you see that clip when you're a kid all the time and now mm -hmm. now he's you know a professional a paid professional that's incredible i've never felt older in my life oh and uh barry bonds won the mvp in 2002 because of course he did if you have a 268 ops plus uh among stats they knew about at the time i bet you nobody knew what ops plus was in 2002 uh you were not giving that award to anybody else no, so that was let's let's count them up. So now 2001 MVP, 2002 MVP, 2000 he finishes runner up. He already has three at this point, so now he's at five. He could have been at seven if not for a couple votes here and there. No one else has five, I think. I no. think I don't. I don't. Uh, maybe yeah. one per. S no, I think it's three. I think three is the second best. Let me look that up. So that means he broke. Three. That means if he, like. You cut, you cut Three. all of, you cut his MVPs off in 1993, and no one's touching them. Yep. And then he goes off and he wins. Spoiler alert: four consecutive MVPs from 2001 to 2004. Finishes his career with seven. So 2003 was really good too. Is it really like? Is that the simplest way to boil it down? Um. Yeah, so I guess frame it this way. It was his worst season <laughs> of the three seasons, and he hit 45 home runs. He OPS plus 231. <laughs> he had one of the best OPS pluses in the history of the sport, and it was probably by far his worst one of the four years. Uh, he had a batting average of 341 and on-base percentage of 529, one of the best of all time. That was significantly less than... 2002 and 2004 um he <laughs> struck out 58 times and walked 148 times which is pretty darn good if you ask me and back to 2002 he walked 47 times i'm sorry struck out 47 times and walked almost 200 times that's something we forgot to touch on is he still stealing bases in this time too 
Um, I was thinking about that before, actually. Not really. He had nine. You know, two, seven. He's not three, But for for a 36, 37-year-old, I think that's pretty good. And you're hitting 46. And a guy his homers. size, too. That's a big boy. I mean, this is also juiced up Barry Bonds. You know, he's got a little more weight on him, I would think. Maybe we can look at the numbers, but... Let me tell you this. So, my dad told me this story a while ago. So, one year my dad got to, like he won something where he got to be in like he got to shadow like the field reporter guy for the Mets uh mm-hmm. one year and it was in 2003 uh, on his birthday and the Giants were there at Shea Stadium so he, sh- he shadowed this guy he, they went into the visiting clubhouse and from mm-hmm. probably 100 150 feet away he sees Mr. Barry Bonds and my dad is like I've never seen bigger shoulders in my life. And then Bonds had two imagine. home runs and the Mets won the game. So a pretty good day for our fan. <laughs> hey, Mr. Mr. Stats, do you think you could give us a little bit of a rundown on Barry Bonds' war each of these three years? You you can pick baseball reference fan graphs. The numbers are still going to pop off. So 2000, wow. I'm actually seeing these for the first time and I'm, <laughs> I'm actually getting starstruck live on air uh so 2001 barry bonds posts 12 and a half f4 2002 he posts oh geez <laughs> wow sorry i'm getting carried away uh, 2002 <laughs> he posts <laughs> he posts 12.7 f4 uh 2003 he posts 10.2 and then in 2004 he posts 11.9 Wow. See, there's like nobody in our lifetimes other than Barry Bonds who's like come to that level at all. No, like I for... think Aaron Judge was in the was in the eleven F four range this year. Aaron mm-hmm. Judge comes up a lot because Aaron Judge, while being a, a massive fan of Barry Bonds growing up in the, the Bay Area, uh, he's a guy who is both the closest thing to Barry Bonds we've probably seen, like for that one year of the sixty two home runs this year probably the closest thing we've gotten since and also like as a fan as i said bay area kid he was judge was out saying oh he's got the real home run record barry bonds i was up watching him every night so he's simultaneously a big bonds defender and the closest thing we've gotten to since then you said like you brought like just to recap i love that you actually had enough wherewithal and you're on the same wavelength as us as being a baseball geek that you brought in information can you just rattle off some of your favorite bonds 01 to 04 nuggets for us uh so aaron judge broke 11 f war in 2022 it was a big deal it was the first time anyone had done that since barry bonds but barry bonds averaged close to 12 f war per season from 2001 to 2004 like that was his average aaron judge people were talking about the walks pitching around him Aaron Judge just hit 62 home runs while walking 16% of the time. In 2001, Barry Bonds hit 73 home runs while playing in a pitcher's park and walking 27% of the time. Do you think that, like, you bring up 12 war kind of feels really low for the impact you're doing there of getting on base more than half the time, hitting consistently home runs in the 40s, getting to the 70s uh, in a year, uh, shattering every rate stat record known to man too. Do you think that, like, like the people who made war almost didn't understand that what they were getting into with bonds because it feels really light to say he won them only 12 games i think what really kind of illustrates this is the world series he had in 2002 in 2002 in seven games versus the angels he had an ops of nearly 2000 he had four home runs he had 13 walks in seven games and they lost and i think that just sort of illustrates you know the effect that one player can have and can't have on a team's success. You look around at some of the other major team sports in North America, Patrick Mahomes as a quarterback is probably worth, you know, five wins more than a replacement level quarterback or the backup, which would be the equivalent of like a 50 war baseball player, which is impossible. So I think it just sort of demonstrates one great thing about baseball is that, you know, on an individual level, it's a series of 1v1s between the batter and pitcher, and yet you could also argue it's an amazing team game because one great player alone does not make you a winner. Uh, do you think that the re- like, even though we're in a much more enlightened sabermetric age now, 
do you think that obviously they knew Barry Bonds was really good do you think they knew how good until we had access to you know all the bold and italics on baseball reference page being so accessible and mainstream I think they knew, you know, I mean, the intentional walks to some degree proves that, right? That that he was treated differently from even guys like Albert Pujols, right? So I think there is some good evidence of that. One thing I think is really interesting about Bonds when you compare him to some of the other greats in MLB history, like Ruth, for example, is that, you know, Bonds putting together like a 10, 11, 12, you know, 13 war season is actually more impressive than Ruth doing it because just the the general quality of the league and the and the talent pool had increased a lot, you know, in the decades since, you know, integration and expansion. So it's it's really interesting. Even even if you take some of the the bond stats at face value and take them seriously, like the OPS plus and the wins above replacement, you have to contextualize that within how the league itself has changed over the last hundred years or so. So you're also are pretty knowledgeable in a few other sports. You weren't in Atlanta United uh, jersey to this recording. Do you think there's any precedent in another sport to this? Anything in the, maybe someone who comes in is not the biggest baseball fan that could like understand what the hell we're talking about here? I think maybe the, one of the most impressive runs I've seen any athlete have would be uh, Usain Bolt. Uh, he won the 100, 200, and 4 by one in three straight Olympics, you know, broke multiple world records in doing so. I think if I just had to point out, you know, any athlete in any sport that was that dominant, it would probably be Bolt. And for reference for people that might not know um, Barry Bonds all that well, Mike Trout, who, you know, everyone deems at least the last few years, especially pre-show as the best player in baseball, one of the best players ever, his best career F4 was 10.2 significantly less than Barry's best at, from ages 36 through 39. So just for reference, he's well ahead of Mike Trout's best at this point of his career in terms of F4. That, those weren't flukes, the F4, the, each of those, those years. He just kept doing it. Yep. Uh, but what was a fluke is, you know, that winning in the postseason thing. Uh, they got trounced by the Marlins into the 2003 National League Division Series uh, back from whence they came. Uh, as soon as possible again. The division series is 97, which I think is the previous so. episode because that's a Giants here. Oh, so I, I pretty much got most of that statement wrong, so thank you. <laughs> <laughs> You're making me laugh more than I've laughed in a really long time. I'm funny after dark, man. This is the after dark <laughs> episode. I also like to change my background every episode. This is the third location I've recorded in, in as many episodes, so I'm keeping it interesting. I refuse I, to stay in the same spot at this point. Even if it's convenient for me to stay, I'll go somewhere else. I'll record from my car. Get it. The start of 2004, uh, we've already covered that the book closed on 03 with a loss and an MVP because of course it did. That's Barry Bonds we're talking about. Uh, in 2002, Bonds went to Japan on one of those MLB uh, all-star tours where they kind of get a group of MLB players together to go to Japan, play some exhibitions, do cool stuff. Bonds does a home run derby out there, and it's a great uh, little bonus nugget for him. But the real thing that you got to talk about is the thing that everyone uh, still knows about that trip is that he made kind of a gentleman's agreement with a relief pitcher by the name of Eric Gagne, who at this time is kind of reliever Barry Bonds. He is on steroids, and he is posting numbers that will just like have you have you think that he's like a Martian or something. Uh, and he's on the Dodgers, arch rival of the Giants and Bonds is kind of venting about what we were talking about to him that just no one wants to pitch to him and they come to an agreement that if there's a situation where they face each other and Bonds cannot win the game he will face him and boy did they face they came to a, the compromise that was made is Gagne gets one off speed pitch the whole at bat and he gets down 0-2 Barry Bonds he throws kind of this perfect curveball, Gagne, uh, in the ninth inning of a game where he's facing him uh, in a three-run three lead, runner on first. So Bonds cannot win the game. It's kind of gentleman's agreement is in play. They're going to face each other. And he throws him a curveball 0-2 that's like 20-plus miles an hour slower than the fastball. And he just, like, stares at it. And it's a, it's it's nearly a perfect pitch. It's Like, you could see, if you watch the clip, it's as close to a strike as you could get without being a strike and being like that it's not a bad call per se 
Uh, and Bond's just like, he stands his ground. It's unbelievable. Like, it almost defies physics that he doesn't react to it. Like how, what the human eye can perceive. And then because he uses the off-speed pitch, it's mano y mano. He's throwing fastballs at 100, 101. Bonds knows they're coming. He's early on 100, 101, fouling him off. Uh, works it up a little bit. And then he hits a home run. Uh, to the deepest part of the ballpark, practically. Because he's Barry Bonds in 2004. It's one of the most impressive, or most entertaining at-bats, probably in Major League history. One of the biggest examples, or most notable examples of immovable object, unstoppable force. And Absolutely. Of course, as he does in essentially every scenario on a baseball field, Bonds comes out on top. So what was your, we have a, a in-depth section about this in the video, what was your favorite part about that at-bat? I like when he hits the long foul ball because that shows that he's like locked in and he's just like, he's like this robot that's just calibrating in on the pitch. The thing though that is crazy is that while you said Barry Bonds comes out on top, the Giants don't. And that's kind of the theme here is that they still lose this game. They, they lost the intentional walk with the bases loaded game. They lose the magical at bat game uh, against Gagne. It's considered one of the most entertaining at bats ever. One of the most fun because... Eric Gagne was so good as a relief pitcher that he won the Cy Young Award. So as a closer, he won the best pitcher in the National League. Very early in the next season, he's facing Bonds. They're both at like their absolute apexes. Uh, and what I want to put the thought into your head now, imagine that with a pitch clock. All that tension is kind of like, I'm extremely, and I mean extremely pro pitch clock, seeing mm -hmm. how it's been in action so far. But I will say that, to take away the tension of that at bat, a pitch clock is kind of the worst thing you could implement. It's interesting. I actually, I don't think I spoke to you about this, but I actually spoke to three of the people in charge with making that rule the other day. Ooh. Yeah, they had some interesting thoughts about it. I, for one, am a fan of it, but something that I did tell them was that um, there, there should be some tweaks that change the rules depending on the situation. And they kind of have those in play, but I don't think it's, it's as well developed as it should be because you lose out on on certain situations like that. And mm -hmm. I think that actually really helps in, in those kinds of situations for, for fan engagement and for, you know, savoring the moment, especially when the uh, the situation is that, that special. You kind of lose that with the pitch clock. But in general, I think it is a good thing. That it, well that, said. That it's there. Yeah. So do you want to give kind of the you know, nuts and bolts of the 2004 Barry Bond stats. Quite possibly the greatest year any human has had playing baseball. Sure. So we've spoken at this point, I don't know, over an hour about how incredibly good Barry Bonds has been. And it seems like it's been one step up after the next. But this is the peak of Barry Bonds. This is the peak of the human male, essentially, in terms of athletic performance. And the stats that this guy puts up this season are insurmountable. I don't think they'll ever be repeated. Just to read off some of them, he wins his second batting title at 362. Pretty basic, especially for Barry. A 609 on base percentage. I believe that's the highest of all time. I think so. Yes, it is unquestionably the highest. Far and away, right? Yeah. 812 slugging. 1.4 OPS. A 263 OPS plus, not quite the 268, but still pretty damn good if I do say so myself. And what's the most eye-popping stat to me, one of the most eye-popping stats in all of the history of baseball, 41 strikeouts, 232 walks, the most ever in a single season. He wins his fourth consecutive MVP. He wins his seventh of his career. He is currently 39 years old. This 39-year-old man. Is putting up the one of the greatest single seasons in the history of sports on this planet and i also have more fun stats if you'll uh... real, real quick yo can i give a sure. shout out to adrian beltre you probably didn't see that coming adrian beltre stole votes from barry bonds in the mvp race that year that's bet you didn't see that coming adrian beltre hit 49 home runs in 2004 unbelievable year for him well good enough that he took people's votes like more than a couple bonds wins but adrian beltre gets like a few votes and that's i just want to make sure he gets his due there real quick so from 2001 through 2004 
Bonds generated more fan graphs tour than the entire offenses of five major league teams in that same time frame. Could you guess those teams, just out of curiosity? Major league teams or National League teams? Major League teams. One of them is definitely the Tigers. Oh, 100%. Yeah. Uh, Kansas City. Yeah, two. Pittsburgh. No. Close. Do I have any... Can I go Milwaukee on there? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Three from uh, Montreal. Five Montreal's got yeah. Guerrero. Oh, Montreal. Montreal. I was going to say Guerrero's on so that four, team. Four out of five you've gotten, guess-wise. Guess, guess wise, there are five teams, so there's a, there's a fifth that we need to get right. Tampa. No. Ooh, wow. You might kick yourself. Baltimore. No. All right, fine, Tom. It's the mess. <laughs> okay, back to the fun stats. So Bonds' 2004 OBP, 609, as we mentioned, he could have made an out in his next 185 plate appearances, and he still would have led the, the sport and on base percentage so yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, the difference between Barry Bonds as far as WOBA weighted on base average for those that don't know it's on base percentage that weights certain outcomes a single is more valuable than a walk a triple is more valuable than a single uh, the difference between first place Barry Bonds and second place Todd Helton is the same as the difference between second place Todd Helton and 44th place Lyle Overbay classic and those crazy differences are they apply each of those four years bonds is in his own league at this point nobody's touching him i don't care that beltray is getting mvp votes adrian beltray is not touching him either and one more thing about gagne he stole second base in a june game gagne was pitching to join the 500 500 club so they had already had some history to that point too which is cool so. i think that this episode is the most I've been unable to like physiologically contain all these new thoughts and this excitement. Like it's, it, this is so nuts to me that I'm like having a hard time, you know, like not going nuts as a person. Like, like it's coming out in like my mannerisms, my, my words, my everything. I, I it's like, it's like, I can't keep it inside how, how nuts this is as just like a cell, like, I'll be the first to admit that I am a dork for baseball stats. And this is like, this is the language I speak. And then some, this is like, if you have a degree in the language I speak, like I speak. He is the best to ever do it. Giants ain't though. They didn't make the playoffs in 04. <laughs> Those are these West coast teams wasting the talents of their superstars. Listen, man, this has been one of my favorite recordings we've done so much fun, so much uncontrollable excitement and humor everything you could ask for uh i had a thought pop into my head probably 10 real time minutes ago that i kind of want to close this off on uh we live in a country that kind of exists on the principle that all men are created equal i disagree they didn't make me and barry bonds the same all right like <laughs> no that's not true they didn't we're not cut from the same cloth even if he's got some you know artificial substances along the way that doesn't change like your ability to hit that hit the baseball but you know that discussion that's for next time i'll see you there pal the kind of the most interesting thing for me is he was part of a generation of baseball player that you know had to go testify in front of congress and he had to deal with you know these perjury charges related to statements he had made under oath regarding his ped usage and i just think ultimately once the narrative took that direction i think we as fans lost the privilege of ever having any sort of closure about this with barry bonds right and and we've had you know, some players come out, Andy Pettit, you know, Alex Rodriguez, and, you know, kind of that we're using in similar times. And, you know, they are able to sort of try to rehabilitate their image and, and bonds, I feel like, because he had to go through so much on the legal side of things over his PED usage. Uh, in the end, you know, our ability to gain any sort of closure for him to rehabilitate his image in any way was kind of forfeited. So it's, it's, it's really an unfortunate thing.